you should be fine. So I've started the recording now. Um, I hope you all are doing well. I, I recognize that this is kind of a disorienting time. And it's especially for those of you that are finishing your degrees this semester, this is really kind of um, a disappointing way to end out your master's degree. Um, but I, I hope we can still have a useful learning experience in the next six weeks. So I, I sent you all um, homework two back last night, and I, I've assigned homework three that's due two weeks from Thursday. Um, I will be, um, you know, especially lenient about trying to get it in on time, like, or, but I, do what you can and let me know if you have problems. Take a look at it early. This homework three is about um, data wrangling and data cleaning. I view it as a, an important and sort of large proportion activity of, of what I do. And so it seemed valuable to really devote a whole homework to it. If, if you know, if you have a lot of experience with munging ugly data files, it will maybe be straightforward. And if you don't have a lot of experience with that, then this will be a great learning experience for you. If you, but if you find the, if you find the work especially painful, um, let me know, and I'll either provide help or cut back on my my intentions. Yeah, and office hours I'm holding virtually or send me an email. Um, we can talk back and forth by email or find another way, Zoom or, or just telephone if you want to talk some other time. If there's anything I can do to help you um, through this, um, you know, difficult educational experience, just let me know. Today we're talking about the bootstrap, which is, I find to be a hugely useful way to get an understanding of um, how, of standard errors, confidence intervals of, of estimates of things. I, I wanted to start by trying to do a poll of your, experience with the bootstrap the this will be um, part of my learning experience in 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 using this um, particular online teaching tool so let's see here's a poll um, Yeah, Carl, I've heard of it at, on a conceptual level, but I've honestly never used it in practice. So I've always been curious to see how you implement it the best way. Ah, so you'd like to see the details of how to actually do it? Yeah, look, I understand conceptually what bootstrapping is, um, but seeing like a raw implementation would be nice. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Or if you just have like references or links, if you want to post them in the chat, I can always go through some like examples on my own too. Very good. So I I will today um, be focusing mostly on concepts and how it works, um, but I'm I, we may have time at the end. I'd be happy to show um, what I what I typically do. What my general experience in using the Bootstrap is to um, kind of brute force it. 
to to learn more about the bootstrap the I mean, my main suggestion is to look at this book by Efren and Tibshirani, An Introduction to the Bootstrap. It's a relatively short and practical book that covers uh, um, you know, use, different uses of it. Brad Efren has a has a longer book on the Bootstrap, um, but I would start with I would start with this one. The Kind of to, to motivate the bootstrap, the, the basic idea is that you have some estimate that you're interested in trying to learn about the, say, the standard error of an estimate. Um, and the, I think a, a good, a, a useful example is, you know, there's some underlying population distribution and you're interested in estimating the 95th percentile of that distribution. You gather some set of data you have data, and with that data, you get the empirical 95th percentile. That's an estimate of the underlying population 95th percentile. And what we want to know is um, how good is this estimate? What is the standard error of this estimate? You know, in a, an example where this might show up is, say, if you're doing a permutation test, and this um, you have some underlying, um, you're trying to estimate the 95th percentile of the permutation distribution of some test statistic. So there's some underlying population that's the distribution of all possible, the test statistic and all possible permutations. And you do a specific set of a thousand permutations and you get your empirical threshold and you want to know what's a thousand, a sample size of a thousand good enough? How well, how well have I estimated this empirical distribution? I mean, this empirical, how, how good of, it, of an estimate is my empirical 95th percentile? So if we knew the population distribution, we could use simulation to work out the standard error of our estimate. If we knew this population distribution, we could sample from it, calculate our estimate, and you know, repeat a bunch of times, and we would get um, you know the true distribution of our estimate, and we could use that um, you know to get this to get a, a good estimate of the standard error of our 95th percentile. But if you know, in practice, we won't know that population distribution. If we knew the population, if we knew what to simulate from here then we would know the 95th percentile and we wouldn't have a job to do. So that, and that's where the bootstrap comes in. So, you know, we don't know the population distribution, but we could say estimate it with our current data. If we, we could, if we had a model for the population distribution, say in this case, I think that this distribution follows something like a scaled chi-square distribution. I could use my I could use my data to estimate that population distribution, and then I could simulate from my estimate, simulate a sample the same size as what I have from my estimated population distribution, estimate the the you know quantity I'm interested in the 95th percentile, repeat that a bunch of times, and then use those results to get an estimated standard error. You know, if, um, if I have a lot of data so that I can get, and if my model is approximately correct, I'll have a good estimate of the population distribution. And so this simulation study I do here will give me a good estimate of the standard error, my standard error of um, the 95th percentile. If I, if I have a lot of data, then, um, well, so that previous, that previous approach is called the parametric bootstrap, where you have a model for the population, you, you have a model for the population, you, es you estimate parameters of that model, and then you simulate from the, the, the fitted model. If you have a ton of data, then you could use the data itself as an estimate of the population distribution. 
So here, this dashed curve is the true population distribution. And if I have a sample of a size of 1,000, I can view that as a reasonably good estimate of the underlying population. So again, I have data. I have, I'm, I'm interested in, I use the data to estimate the 95th percentile of the population. I want to know how good is this estimate. To do that, I want, um, I can simulate from an estimate of the population. In the parametric bootstrap, I fit a specific model to the population and simulate from that. In this non-parametric bootstrap, I'm going to just take my actual data, the empirical distribution for my data as my model for the underlying population. So I'll, I'll take my data, I'll simulate from that. I simulate, simulating here would be taking samples with replacement from my existing data. With that sort of resampled data, I estimate the 95th percentile. And then I repeat that whole process a thousand times. I get a thousand 95th percentiles, each derived from a different sort of sample with replacement from my observed data. And I can use that to get an estimate of the standard error of the the of my estimate or to get a, you know construct a confidence interval for the underlying population distribution All right so i I've, I've emphasized a number of times about um, th that computer simulation is really useful it's useful for understanding the behavior of of <clears throat> it's it and the, the bootstrap is basically saying it's really useful here Keith you have a question yeah um, so I was just to make sure I understand this correctly so you overlaid a chi-square distribution over your data and then you did a thousand iterations of grabbing a random sample of that chi distribution and then a, among those thousand you grabbed the 95th percentile of each um, like sample population from that distribution? That, yes, that's right. So, I mean, in the, so in the, in the parametric bootstrap, I, I have my data and I fit this blue curve. And then I'm going to sample from that blue curve and get a sample as a size of a si the same size as my data set from the blue curve, yeah. calculate the 95th percentile, repeat that a bunch of times, and take the standard deviation of those estimates as okay. my estimated standard error. Okay. In this not in this non-parametric bootstrap, I skip the fit a chi squared distribution to this data. I take my existing data, the histogram here, and I sample I sample with replacement from it. So I, I get a new data set that is the same size as my original data, it has some values duplicated and some seen, it's in some not observed. So I have, I have some you know, distribution of my data and I pretend like that's the true population by taking a sample of size n with replacement from that to get this resampled version of the data. I, I use, take the 95th percentile of those and then I repeat that whole process a bunch of times and get a set of a, a thousand estimated 95th percentiles and I use the standard deviation of those as my estimate of the standard error of the 95th percentile. Okay. So that, I mean, this, you know, simulating a process to try to learn about the, you know, to learn about the behavior of an estimate is a good thing. And the bootstrap is sort of, it's basically doing that. Um, it treating that if, if simulation is a good thing, well, then this bootstrap is a good thing. Uh, and uh, often, 
when exposed to this bootstrap, especially the non-parametric bootstrap, the focus is on the resampling of taking your data and sampling with replacement from it to get a new data set and repeating that process many times. But I would emphasize instead that um, to, to think of this as having an estimate of the underlying population and then simulating from that. The estimate, your estimate of the underlying population could be you know, using a model. You have a model for the underlying population. You, you get estimates of the model from your data and then you simulate from that fitted distribution. Or it could be in the non-parametric, in the non-parametric bootstrap that your estimate of the population you take just to be your current data. So you're going to estimate the population as your current data and then simulate from that. And simulating from that estimate will end up being this, you know, sampling with replacement from your existing data. Um, this seems like a good idea. How can we tell if it works? What you, how to tell if this works, you could simulate. So if you have an, if you have, um, a particular situation you're interested in, you can simulate that situation and see if the bootstrap worked in that case. Like I can have some model for the underlying population, simulate data from that, and then apply the bootstrap in that particular case. Um, you know, go, going back a couple slides. So if, if I, I could take some, I could take some model for this population, simulate data from that, apply this whole bootstrap, and then repeat that entire thing a bunch of times. And I can use that to see whether the, you know, are the standard errors that I'm getting from the bootstrap, do they actually correspond to the real variation I'm getting in this, in this estimate? So the, you know, taking that to a kind of another level is using a nested bootstrap as a way to figure out whether the bootstrap works. You know, I have some existing data that is sampled from some population. And I'm going I'm, to, I'm interested in using the bootstrap to try to estimate the 95th percentile of the underlying population. Um, well, and I want to know, is that going to work well? Well, what I can do is just say, take this data as my underlying population and ask if the underlying population followed this empirical distribution, how would the bootstrap work? So I could take take my existing data as if it were the true population, get, a, get some, you know, sample, so, sample of size n drawing with replacement from it, and take this as, as if this were, this were my data. And then with these data, I apply the bootstrap. I pretend that these data are the underlying true population, sample with replacement from it, calculate the 95th percentile, repeat a bunch of times, I get this distribution here of estimates. I take their standard deviation as my estimate of it and then repeat that entire process a bunch of times. Sample with replacement from the data to get a new sample, apply the bootstrap to that and get a new estimate of the SD. Sample with replacement from my data, apply the bootstrap to that get a new estimate of the SD, repeat a whole bunch of times. So th this is not, this is something 
this nested bootstrap is something that you would do only if you were trying to figure out how well the bootstrap worked in your particular context. But applied to these particular data that are shown in this figure, um, these are the, the bootstrap, nested bootstrap results that I would get that um, the histogram on the top are, I, I sampled a thousand times from that original data set and calculated the 95th percentile. This is the distribution of 95th percentiles I got. F for each of these data sets that gives me one of these 95th percentiles, I've applied the bootstrap as well. Um, and each of them gives me an estimated standard error. And this is the histogram of the estimated standard errors from those bootstrap replicates. So I have up here, this is, you know, the SD of my estimates. So this is like, if that, pop, if my data were the true population, this SD of 2.14 would be, this is the true standard error of the 95th percentile, or really an estimate of it. And down here, these are, these are the standard errors that the bootstrap is giving me. So sometimes I'm getting an estimate of about three, and sometimes I'm getting an estimate of about one. On average, it's giving me an estimate of 2.0, which is slightly smaller than the you know, kind of the, what you'd call the true standard deviation. And it's, you know, has a variability that's like it's typically off by about 0.5. So in, in this case here, I would say that the bootstrap works well to get an estimate of the standard error of a 95th percentile. It has some weaknesses that the, the, the standard error is a bit noisy. Um, And it, it looks to be slightly biased, like the standard errors that the bootstrap is giving me are slightly too small. The distribution you're seeing from the bootstrap in this top histogram has this kind of multimodal distribution because the 95th, the empirical 95th percentile can only be at points where I have data. So there'll be little, I mean, th this histogram can only have values where my actual data points are. And that um, is one weakness. Any questions so far? I, f I find the bootstrap really useful. Um, it, in the, in really in the, for something like a, you know, 95th percentile, it's, it's not easy to get um, a standard error theoretically. Um, there, you know, there are formulas you can look up and try to do it. But the, the bootstrap is just a kind of quick and dirty method for getting the standard error of anything that just requires you to be able to estimate, um, you know, derive your estimate a bunch of times with, with you know, samples from some estimate of the population. It works, you know, it works best if you have a lot of data. If you don't have very much data, it's going to work really not very well at all. Um, and and if you don't have very much data, I would go with the parametric version where, you know, rely on a model for the underlying population. But even then, it, it you if you don't have very much data, you won't have a very good estimate of the underlying population. And so the bootstrap estimates of the standard errors may be quite variable.
But the, in so in my research area in you know trying to map genes affecting a quantitative trait, QTL mapping. Um, about the time that I was finishing my graduate work, this paper on the on confidence intervals for 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 QTL locations by bootstrapping came out and was you know very well received. Um, lots of people use this approach. Um, that is that it seemed really valuable because the existing methods to try to get at a confidence interval for the location of a QTL um, don't work terribly great. So, you know, in QTL mapping, we, we do this scan across a chromosome and at every position we calculate some test statistic that's sort of evidence for a QTL at that position. And we look at, um, you know, we look at the, you know, the peak, if this is high, then my test statistic achieves some large value. I say there looks to be a QTL there. The, the main way in which you might get a confidence interval for the, you know, you know, my estimate of the QTL is at this location, but where could it plausibly sit? The main way to do it is to drop down some amount in this test statistic and look at the the interval with the interval in which the the log score is within a one and a half say of its maximum and from this point to this point over here we say that's our interval for where we think the QTL might sit in this particular case it drops down and then comes back up again and that's sort of a problem you know you might take two disconnected intervals but I'm not sure you'd really believe that. But this has been the major approach for, this had been the major approach for um, constructing a confidence interval for where you think a QTL might sit. Um, and it, this works because the, this log curve is, a, is the log base 10 likelihood, um, likelihood ratio comparing the hypothesis that there's a QTL there to the, the null hypothesis of no QTL. And differences in this, this LOD score end up being basically relative. It, the difference between the LOD score here and the LOD score here ends up being also a log base 10 likelihood ratio, comparing the plausible, the location being this location versus that location. So it ends up working reasonably well, but it doesn't behave as a proper confidence interval in that like the coverage, the chance that this interval will cover the true location varies depending on um, the strength of the, of the effect of the locus. Another approach to get a confidence interval for QTL location was to was this approximate Bayes interval. Basically, take this log likelihood and take 10 to that, turn it turn it back into a, a likelihood, and then pretend like you have really a likelihood of one parameter, and that the the put a prior on QTL location to be uniform along the chromosome. So you rescale this likelihood so that it, it integrates to one, so that the area underneath this 10 to the LOD score has, one, has area one, and then find the region that covers 95% of the area, sort of an approximate Bayes interval. This, um, this approach, I mean, it's another way to get an interval estimate of the location of the QTO. It ends up being, you know, pretty similar to the, the LOD support interval. Um, and it has some advantages over the LOD support interval. But so the, this paper in 1996 by Peter Vischer and colleagues, they proposed to use a, a bootstrap in this case. So the idea is <coughs> you would take your existing data, resample from it, say take whole, you know, I have, say, data on, on 
150 mice. I'm going to sample with replacement from those 150 mice. With so some mice will get duplicated, some mice won't be observed, and do a scan along the chromosome with that resampled version of my data, and do that a bunch of different times. So the the orange curve here, the green curve here, the purple curve, those are different. Um, these log curves along the chromosome with um, different resampled data sets, um, sampling with replacement from the existing mouse data. For each of these curves, find the maximum loca find the location of the maximum LOD score as my estimate of the QTL, and get this histogram down here is a thousand times I took a sample of size n from my n mice, calculated the LOD curve, found the estimated location, repeated a bunch of times, and um, histogram and take say the the area that contains 95 percent of the estimates they take the two and a half percentile to the 97 and a half percentile and call that my 95 percent confidence interval so seems like a great idea lots of people were doing it but often you'd get these distributions that don't quite reflect what you'd think the estimate, um, it, it doesn't reflect what you might think the sampling distribution of the estimate is. Um, that you tend to have these spikes in this bootstrap distribution at the location of the genetic markers. You know, so this log curve, it sort of changes direction wherever there's a marker where you have data and it sort of billows out in between the markers. And the, the maximum, the, your estimate of the location of the QTL tends to be at those cusps. And that is reflected in that bootstrap distribution. And I looked at that, I looked at that bootstrap distribution and I thought, this doesn't really seem right. It doesn't reflect what I th think the uncertainty in it, if my estimate is. And so I said, let's do a simulation study and see, does this bootstrap actually work? And that led to this paper, sort of 10 years after the original paper, poor performance of bootstrap confidence intervals for the location of a quantitative trait locus. Um, so I, the, the idea was I didn't really trust that this bootstrap was working right. Um, how to tell whether it works right? Well, let's simulate and see. So the, the simulation study was basically do a back cross that is um, that, you know, a simple experimental cross where at, at every location mice have one of two possible genotypes. Do 200 individuals because that's sort of a typical size study. Let's focus on a single chromosome and just 11 equally spaced markers along that chromosome. Just sort of at the time, um, 15 years ago, sort of a typical size study that I would be working on. We're going to simulate a, a single QTL, single locus on that chromosome with a reasonably large effect. Um, the you know, everything nicely following a normal distribution. Then I'm going to vary the location of the QTL. That, um, I'm going to step along the chromosome at each position along the chromosome at one centimorgan steps. I'm going to fix the QTL to be at that location. I'm going to simulate data, get an estimated QTL location, repeat many times. But I'll also, so, for every QTL position, I'm going to do 10,000 simulations of data sets with that QTL position. And for each of those 10,000 simulation replicates, I'm going to do a bootstrap with size 1,000. And I'm also going to apply the other two methods. So I'm doing here um, at, every, at each of the 100 locations, 
sort of 10,000 times 1,000 scans of a chromosome. So 10 million um, calculations. And then I'm doing that 100 times. So a billion calculations I'm doing or something. But it, per, perfectly feasible, really, because the calculations are pretty fast. Um, so the first thing to look at is just the distribution of the estimated QTL location. So these histograms are, I'm varying the theta is the true location of the QTL. So in the, in the, the top histogram, the QTL is sitting right here at the end of the chromosome. And in 10,000 simulations, this is the distribution of the QTL estimated QTL locations. When the true QTL is here, it's mostly out exactly correct. And I'm off by, you know, no more than about 10 centimorgans. Um, but, you know, there is a little spike out here and a spike out here where I'm occasionally off by 20 or 30 centimorgans. When the QTL is sitting here, is at one centimorgan, most of the time, I'm, my estimate is at the marker that's adjacent to it, when the QTL is at two centimorgans, I'm again mostly getting an estimate that's at the marker adjacent to it. When the QTL is exactly in between the first two markers, you know, this is the distribution of the estimated QTL location in 10,000 simulations. There's this tendency of the estimate to tend to be at the markers. Um, you know, this is a, a nice quantitative distribution of estimated locations in the interval in between, but still there are these little spikes that occur at the markers. If I move the QTL again over to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 centimorgans, um, you can see that I have this distribution around the my estimated distribution around the true location, but it is punctuated by this point mass, this little spike at the marker location, that the, the estimated QTL location tends to be at a marker and not at the sort of, Except for this sort of edge of the chromosome effect, the estimated locations are unbiased, but they have this odd behavior of be, tending to be at these, where the markers are, which are evenly spaced at the 10 centimorgan spots. Here, moving over to where the, this is, you know, we could, we could look at 101 of these little distributions, but here the QTL is, is distributed from 42 centimorgans down to 50 centimorgans. Um, you know, the, the estimated distribution, I mean, the, this is the, the observed distribution of my estimate when the QTL is exactly at this location. It's, un, I get an unbiased estimate, but it has this spike at the markers. That is, um, it, it tends to be, it, you know, it's much more often at the marker near my QTL than at the QTL itself. When I'm at a position in between markers, I may be more likely to be at the Q, true QTL location than anywhere else, but I still have these little point masses happening at the markers at the ends. But that, what I was really inter interested in is the coverage of the bootstrap interval. So, you know, for, at every, for every possible position of a QTL, I simulated 10,000 data sets and I calculated the, the Bayes interval, the LOD interval, and this bootstrap interval. For every data set, I calculated the bootstrap interval, repeated a bunch of times. Um, and th so the black curve here shows the proportion of the time that the bootstrap interval actually covered the true location, which when the QTL is at a marker, 
the bootstrap tended to cover that marker. It had coverage that was around you know 99 percent. But when the when I when the QTL was simulated to be right adjacent to a marker, the coverage really dipped down to be, you know, below the, below the nominal level of 95 percent. That was my target. When the when the QTL is at a marker, the coverage is really high. But when the QTL is in sort of directly adjacent to a marker, the bootstrap coverage was poor. The bays and in blue and the LOD support intervals in pink, sort of the, the other standard approaches for getting um, confidence intervals for QTL location, they also show this variation that their coverage is higher when um, the true QTL is at a marker and the coverage is lower when the true QTL is in between markers. But both of them tend to be a bit conservative. So, that, I mean, so this is the, the standard approach for trying to show how well a, a given method of the confidence interval is working. I have a method for producing confidence intervals, and I want to know, does it produce confidence intervals that um, are covering the true parameter at the rate expected? You know, I, I simulate this bootstrap I, I coverage by stepping across the chromosome at every position, simulate 10,000 data sets for each data set, do you know, a thousand replicates of the bootstrap and get a confidence interval, and then say how many of the 10,000 confidence intervals covered the true estimated location. It looks like it works really well, except when it doesn't work well, it it um, it, it it doesn't it doesn't work well when the QTL is sitting directly adjacent to a marker. A problem is that we don't actually know whether the true QTL location is directly adjacent to a marker or is at a marker. What we observe is just the estimated location of the QTL. We don't get to observe the true location of the QTL. So we won't know with our data whether our interval is you know, in this happy medium, I mean, this happy situation where it's doing really well, that it's either sort of in between markers or at a marker or it's in the very sad situation where the true QTL is adjacent to a marker and our given bootstrap confidence interval is behaving badly. But we had this idea here to also, I mean, for, for each data set that I simulated, I know not just the true QTL location, but I know what the estimated location was for that particular data set. So I could use these same simulation results, and instead of plotting coverage versus the true location, I can plot coverage versus the estimated location. And so, you know, I've, I've stepped across the genome, or this chromosome, at every position I've simulated data where the QTL was exactly at that position. But here in this picture, I'm saying, Take all of those, take all of those data sets where the estimated location is at 90 centimorgans. Some of the some of the time it's really at 90. The true QTL is there, and many of the times the true QTL is at some other position in between markers, and it just happened to be the estimated location there. And then ask, of all the times where the estimated location was at 90 centimorgans, what percent of the time did the bootstrap interval cover the true location, which may not be this location, it's whatever the true one is. And th this was a big surprise to me. Um, the, if you look at the coverage of the bootstrap interval relative to where the estimated location is, you kind of the opposite picture of the previous one. When the estimated QTL location is in between markers, coverage tends to be, um, well, it's not always 
above 95%, but coverage is best when your estimated location is in between markers. And the coverage is really bad when your estimated location is at a marker. The other two methods really have much more stable coverage. The coverage is pretty similar all across the chrome. There's some edge effect where the coverage tends to be higher when the estimated location is near the end of the chromosome. But basically, it doesn't matter where your estimate is, the coverage of the LOD interval and the Bayes interval is pretty stable. But the, the bootstrap has this behavior that when your estimated QTL location is at a marker, the bootstrap interval you'll get tends to be not covering the, well, it, it's, covering the true location at a much lower rate. My, so my interpretation of this is that um, when your estimated QTL location is at a marker, you will have an, an um, overly optimistic view of your precision of mapping. And so the bootstrap interval will be too small and what will have a lower than the target rate of coverage. Whereas when your estimated QTL location is in between markers, in those cases, the, your kind of view of the quality of the estimate is about right or maybe a bit pessimistic. And so the bootstrap will, interval will cover a bit above the nominal rate. But I viewed this as kind of the death now for the bootstrap in this particular context, um, that the, this variability in coverage, depending on where the truth lie, um, sort of that is indicating that, the, the, that in particular context, the bootstrap is not doing a very good job of um, characterizing the quality of the estimate. And so not giving a very good, doing a very good job of characterizing, um, a, you know, providing a confidence interval. The, so, you know, you know, summarizing this, that the bootstrap can be super useful and I use it widely in my work that, I mean, it's a, a quick way to get an understanding of how well you, you've estimated something. That just with the existing data, you can get an estimated standard error by using your existing data to approximate the underlying population and so then simulating from that. It can behave really badly. It, not very often, but this is, you know, I've shown you one case where it behaves badly. I think what you need is that the error in your estimate does not depend on the underlying truth. If the distribution of theta hat minus theta is independent of theta, then the bootstrap should perform well. But like in this particular, you know, the case, the distribution of, of my error depends on whether the true location is at a marker or in between markers, then the, this bootstrap is not going to behave well. And really, sort of the, the lesson here is that if the results look wonky, um, you know, a technical term for these results are different than what I would have expected. They don't reflect my, what I would think the uncertainty is in the bootstrap, or in the, the uncertainty that sh there should be in my estimate. If the results look wonky, maybe you shouldn't trust them. And how do you tell? You simulate. Um, so in this particular case, this odd tendency for the estimated QTL location to be at a marker makes it so that this theta hat minus theta really depends, its behavior, the errors that I get depend on whether the 
the QTL is at a marker or in between markers, that sort of destroys the behavior of the bootstrap in this case. Que questions at all? So you, um, uh, Carl, I guess I, I had something. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm thinking about situations where you kind of aren't certain about the distribution of your data. I feel like even the nested bootstrap has issues if you're going to, simulate from this, I, I guess it goes back to really the weakness of the bootstrap with small data. Like if you have this distribution and it could really be, like if you have some right skewed distribution and it could very well be left skewed in you know, another 200 samples, is there really anything you can do in that situation? Yeah, so I mean, kind of a, a critical first point is that the that the data are of high quality that there's some underlying population and your existing data is you know reflects a random sample from it if if you have a you know a nice random you know an unbiased random sample of size 200 from some population then and you if you if it's right skewed the chance that the underlying population will be left skewed is really small. You know, a sample of size 200 would give you a good understanding of, of what's going on. If, on the other hand, there's bias in the sampling that's giving rise to the data, then there's, the, there's no way for the bootstrap to get around that. Um, and there's, there's not an easy, you would need to, somehow model that bias in your data collection process. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I just, um, I just, it's coming from like a social science background, I guess um, there's just a lot of situations where like, saying, oh, well, this is definitely, I can just fit a normal distribution to this. There, there's a lot of context where that's just not, not a great assumption. Um, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if the existing data does not reflect the underlying population well, then um, it'll be it'll be hard to get an understanding of how your estimate is behaving, and the and that I mean that is sort of a separate ch challenge. I, we're in you know in many cases that we work with that our data are reasonably well behaved, and we may have a model that we trust, we may not, but the boots in that case where we believe that the the data collection process was good, the, the bootstrap can be useful to get an understanding of, of uncertainty that is um, challenging to derive theoretically. So it doesn't solve all of our problems, but it solves, it, it solves some of them when we have um, nicely behaved data. It, but, you know, in this particular case study that I presented today, um, in the, just the behavior of that particular estimate was such that um, even with really good data, the bootstrap did not behave well. 
and so didn't work well in that context. Hi, Carl. I have a Hi. question. So, so for example, if we have the, like the data is from the microarray data, and since like each each gene, for example, they have the replicates replicates inside it. So, if if we want to take the medium of those replicates, we may not have that much that much sample inside a inside the whole microarray data. So, in that situation, we should perform the non-parametric bootstrap or since recently I'm analysis the data from the microarray, so it's kind of confused me that I'm not sure how to deal with the replicates here. So if if, if I take all replicates of the whole data set, it fit a it fit the model pretty well. So in that case, I think we we can use the parametric parametric bootstrap. But if I take the medium of each take the medium from the replicates and the data didn't fit any models well. So in that situation, I'm not sure how to deal with that. So, I mean, so you're, you're comparing two groups of samples and looking for differential expression? Yes, it's something like that. And what, I mean, so what I, size samples do you have? Uh, actually, after taking a medium, it only have like 3,000. Actually, it's not a, a gene mic, a RNA seq microarray. It's, uh, RNA microarray is from the peptide. It's, it's the peptide microarray. So I only, okay. if I take the median, I only got like 3,000 and 3,000 peptides totally. Total, no, but total how, 3, how, many, peptides. how many biological samples do you have? Biological samples? I think yes. I got like around, actually, they don't get a biological sample, to be honest. That's the data I got from the doctor. So it's, kind of confused me currently for that. So, I mean, so, so, the, uh, so the, the, the data has measurements on 3,000 peptides. Yes. And you have some number of replicates of that. Yes, this, the, the replicates are on the single slide. It's more like the technical replicates on the single slide. It, Yeah, that, I mean, the, in in that case, I think the bootstrap will not help you because um, you would, I mean, the, the bootstrap really would only work if you have, you know, many biological samples. It doesn't, it doesn't really help with the, the pooling across um, peptides in any way. Okay. But, you know, without, without biological replicates, it's hard to know what you could say at all about uncertainty in those peptide measurements. Yes, I agree with that. Thanks, Carl. Sure. So Keith had asked about um, the the practical matter of of doing this kind of bootstrap. So, <laughs> excuse me, in in both R and and probably Python, there are um, tools to try to get at. Um, I mean, tools to to help you to um, perform the bootstrap. But I I guess I tend to. Um, just do it by hand. Although, so I, and the, in the, let's see if I can find this. So, I mean, if, if you go to the, the GitHub page for this class, um, and go to the, I mean, this bootstrap lecture, you can, 
find in the in the R directory um, my code that I actually use to do this nested bootstrap. It's. I keep forgetting they, you have uh, repos available. I should definitely be looking at those. So it's it's not very it's not going to be very pretty this code that I'm using here, um, but basically using a bunch of the function sample. Um, you know, if I if I give the function sample in R a, a vector and I say replace equals true, it'll sample from that vector with replacement and give me a data set that's the same size back. So I do that repeatedly. Um, and it the these I think that you know I I mean I didn't write this code with you know illustrating the bootstrap in mind i did it just to like i need to make these figures for this lecture that i'm giving next week online um and that so the the code is pretty ugly um but it I mean basically i take I use sample, calculate the quantile, and repeat a bunch of times. Build up a vector, and and that'll be my estimate. Um, and I, I could I could look for better code that's more illustrated of it, but um, I think I was going to look into as well as if there's any like maybe some pre-built modules or libraries that might also be able to run simulations more efficiently than trying to run them by hand. Because some of the primitives in Python I know aren't super efficient. So some of the libraries utilize uh, different encoding on the back end. Mm -hmm. So the, in the, you know, the, the, the computation time to do the bootstrap is to, you know, formulating the problem, um, doing the, the bootstrap replicates, and calculating your estimate. And I would say most of the time it's the, you know, for, for, complicated, for complicated estimates, like, you know, some sort of fancy machine learning thing, it's that calculating the estimate that's going to be the most time consuming. And the wrap it inside a, you know, sample with replacement for my existing data, that part is really, you know, two lines of code and doesn't take any time at all. So I guess my experience applying the bootstrap, the, it, the, there's not much that an, an external library would do to help me other than maybe I want to do that in parallel. So I could calculate, I could sample with replacement from my data a thousand times, create a thousand data sets, and then do you know my time-consuming estimation procedure a thousand times in parallel, and that um, it's that sort of parallel analysis of a thousand different data sets that would be the thing that I would want to get help from in a bootstrap um, sort of uh, you know library. But it'd really be about, you know, it, less about the bootstrap per se and more about parallel calculations in Python or R. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to look into that too. I, Okay, I, I will stop the recording.